TLO was popping. We are on Twitch. We are live. But by the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, man. Right behind me, you see a little warning screen just in case. You never know. Uh, Twitch.com is where you can catch a live stream. Usernames at the bottom of the screen. And don't forget, we do got Patreon, where we post five to ten times a week, including Premier League extended highlights. Those are some of my favorite reactions. And y'all will be surprised about my football knowledge in this little of a time. I just want to let you know, man. Link down in the description for all of that as well, man. This is Liverpool's gangster. Billy Moore tells his story. This is on the... Um, Anything goes with James English. Shout out James English, man. Continuously keeping it coming, man. Talk to me, though. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. Episode 47. This was some years on. ago. We're on. Yes, and today's guest, we've got Billy Moore. How are you, brother? Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for that. was in the LA Fitness with you. Inviting me. You're a good man. Read the book, watched the film. Fascinating. Very interesting. You've had a, a bit of a mad life growing up in Liverpool. Um, spent a lot of time in prisons, I think over 22, 20 prisons. 22 prisons. Yeah, yeah. 22 prisons. Man, and we've been to 22 man. prisons? God, Billy, what was you doing outside? You was outside. Yeah, you've had an experience and a half, but it'd be good to go right back to the start and how it all began and how you got involved in the stuff you got involved in. Yeah, yeah it's a good start, to be honest. Uh, the beginning, is it's always... See, I never like, woke up one day and said I'm going to have a career in... Uh, in, crime. in crime and, and spending years and decades in fact in prisons I wanted to be a boxer uh, I wanted to impress my dad I wanted to show him that you know I could be somebody and the reality of it was he was an alcoholic I lived in a violent you know what's crazy man I be like a lot of parents don't understand, like, kids be wanting to impress their parents, and especially their fathers. They be wanting to impress them, and they'll be stressed out, and anxiety will occur from it. Like, a lot of kids, the parents be missing that. I hope I don't miss that as a dad, that my daughter or, and my kids is trying to impress me, and I'm in a, just that, that pressure on them is, is, is essentially messing them up in some way mentally. I don't want to miss that as a parent. I don't. Balance household. Um, I was quite vulnerable, quite scared. I felt separate and different and alone even growing up. And eventually, you know, anything I tried to do, never, um, I, never got, I never got the acceptance or the approval that I wanted of them. Um, so I found myself standing on the street corners and finding approval and acceptance of, of kids gangsters. my own age yeah. in, um, in the streets of Liverpool. I mean, I found that really difficult. To, uh, you know, I boxed for a long time. Up until, well, see, when I say a long time, I mean, from the age of 11, you know, I started karate at first. It was like, take, uh, it was short again karate. I tried that. It wasn't for me. I was never good at football because I'd never get picked. You know, I was one of them kids that I'd always get chosen last and I'd always be the goalie or, you know, we're going to have him. So I thought I'll do something that's for myself and, and I boxed for a little while, you know, and I won a few fights. Um, I started to build my own self-esteem up by doing that. I started to feel good about myself. Didn't need uh, my self-esteem from other people then. Um, Jim, bro. And then girls, you know, meeting girls, spending time with their friends and, you know, trying out drugs but for me the minute I put a drug in my body I realised that it took away all that all those feelings of uh, loss and uh, abandonment and, yeah and abandonment and rejection and, and, and fear you know I, I had that courage to to be someone's difference um, but he also had an allergy 
you know, I wasn't the kind of person that broke out in lumps and bumps, I broke out in handcuffs, pain, misery and loss, you know, and, and, I, and I spent years in, um, in correctional facilities uh, in isolation most of the time. And I suppose I felt comfortable on my own, you know, getting labelled as well as like, uh, he's nuts or he's round a bend or he's, he's crazy or he's, he's skits, he's a skits of and feeling comfortable with all those labels. You know, mm. was, but when I was on my own in a cell, and the door was shut. I knew how lonely I felt. You know, I felt really, really lost, really lonely. Um, and what age were you? It's a lot of time for self-reflection in them in themselves. Billy, when you first got the jail, sixteen. Hey, yeah. what was the crime for? I think it was a uh, swat back then. It was taken without only consent. It was a car theft, but it was a few. The all added up. It was like, at the beginning, it was, um, I think it's called UTMV today. No. Oh, no, sorry, it was UTMV back then, and that yeah. was called SWAT, you know what I mean? Which is an offer I was taking on motor vehicles. Um, Andalan stolen goods, burglary, theft. Um, so they was watching you? They were all the initial kind of arrest that he had in the beginning. The kind of usual suspects to, like I say, if you're in that, if you're, kind of got those abandonment issues you're kind of searching for something you're craving that maybe attention if you're doing bad stuff we get that adrenaline rush yeah. where we feel good and then we're, we've got that buzz that we, that we don't get so we end up dabbling into drugs to get that dopamine kick where we're feeling good we feel alive yeah. and before you know it you it just gets worse and worse and worse with the drugs when did you start hitting the drugs kind of seeing it the it's heavier stuff the heavier stuff i mean it started with cannabis initially and that was the gateway drug. And then from then on, it was... Um, oh, my God. How many of people agree that cannabis... I, I feel like cannabis can be a great gateway drug. But also, at the same time, I don't. <laughs> like, for it depends, man. It depends, man. I don't think... Can, no, I, I'm going to be real. I don't think cannabis is a gateway drug, in my opinion. I think you can get around some people through the commonality of cannabis and these other people can do other drugs and they can introduce you you know what i'm saying lsd without going into a drugology of things yeah. it was like it, it soon spiraled into a uh, using heroin and crack cocaine you know within months of being in the grip of that drug i was in prison i was in a young offenders i remember my first time i went there um I was uh, in withdrawal stages, uh, there was no help or rehabilitation or any kind of medication that he gave you back then. So you put you in a cell and you're on a hardcore cold turkey and it was... Um, Rough. Bro. And he always... Pro I'll never, never do this again. I'll never do it again. And then, I'd say, within two weeks of being released, I was back at it. Oh God, and that's the thing about alcoholism too. People, people, I bet you, I bet you... 80% of the people who watch this video that I'm putting on YouTube have told themselves, man, I ain't drinking again no more. And went back the next weekend, probably at the pub right now. And I ain't, hey, to each day on, you know what I'm saying? I just help everybody get the help they need. Addiction is real. Whether you know you're addicted or not. And I was on that cycle of um, repeating the same mistakes, but accepting, ex 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 expecting, you know, expecting different, different results. results. Mm -hmm. when you went, uh, did you get clean? Did you go to rehab, get clean, and then went to Thailand to change your life? Yeah, well, well it's, that was... Um, 2003 was like a significant moment in my life. I remember being on the yard in HMP Liverpool. And I was looking around thinking, you know, I don't want to be here. You know, I couldn't face reality. Um, I needed help, but I didn't know how to ask for it. And it was the office day of the year, and a few of the lads decided to stay out and climb on the roof. And I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> uh, and three lads climbed on the roof, and the first guy that got up there, the whole prison, screamed with yells of approval, all the windows were banging, everyone was going, go ahead, lad. And I looked up and thought, I want a bit of that. And I was the third guy up, and I climbed up, and halfway up, I slipped and fell down. And I remember this, this screw call, Mr. Muscle, saying, you'll never get up there, you fat ass. <laughs> 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 you know, that pride and that ego. And 
you know I'll show him yeah I'll show him and the failure uh, so climbs up and I was halfway up again and I was struggling you know and the rest of the guys <laughs> that were up there pulled me up and it turned into something like an off sea rescue you know what I mean <laughs> but the minute I got up all the um, all the lads were screaming all the windows were banging go on Billy is right and then um, I was like I felt importance at that time for that moment I felt really like accepted by the prison community and then it stopped and it was about the guy that was getting up next you know my 15 minutes of fame so to speak it ended but when I, I always speak about this because it became a really significant uh, movement in, in, in my decision making I went to um, a prison after that spent a long time in solitary confinement due to my behaviour and I remember when the door got shut, I'd feel really hurt and lost and that, and I'd have tears in my eyes. But when that door had opened, I'd pretend, I'd put a mask on and I'd act as if everything was here, okay. And there was no one I could speak to, you know, everyone had shut the door on me, I'd be in tall bridges. And he had a couple of pounds on the... That drug addiction, man, that drug addiction that make people close the door on you 100%. You can be in and out of jail for a, a, a long time, but people will still, you know, have you in their heart. As soon as the drug addiction kick in and they can't trust you no more, and they... That's it. Credit. The phone credit. And I thought, I'll phone my mum. And I remember speaking to my mum on the phone and she's saying, um, I remember getting opened up, actually, and these two big screws took me to the phone. And I'm acting hard, walking with a swagger. And, um, the minute, the minute um, my mum answered the phone and heard my voice, she was quite like, where are you and what's going on? And I knew, you know, that she cared and I had a lump, I had a lump in my throat and I felt really emotional and I couldn't, um, I couldn't answer her. And um, she knew, she just said, I know, you need help. And that was the first time that I put pen to paper and wrote a letter to her. W, mom. Um, a probation officer requesting help and it came in the form of a, um, a rehabilitation in Bristol and that's where I went that's where I got my recovery How long were you on recovery for? Initially it was three years How were you was, feeling? Then oh, However long it take Well I was going through lots of loss really I was um, and lots of blame you know, blame me dad for the for the way it, it turns out um, you know, there was lots of sadness, but I was also excited as well at the the opportunity of getting a new kind of way of life in it. A new it? life. Yeah. So is that when you decided to go to Thailand? Well, it's funny, really. Um, I've got a passport. You know, the recovery accessories. I got a phone, a passport, a few friends that liked me, um, the odd girlfriend, and then someone offered me, you know the opportunity to go to Thailand for three months on a backpacking holiday. I shaved up and went along to Thailand. I guess though, it's like a good place to find yourself if you really go in there to be on the backpack and doing the thing. But Thailand, you could get really get lost in the sauce and Thailand. Thailand, one of them places, man. Thailand, one of them places that if you try to stay on a straight and narrow, it might suck you into some, some dark stuff. You gotta be careful in Thailand. Not only the lady boys, but just, just everything else associated with Thailand. The criminality, the, the drugs, all of that. It's all... It's all deep, isn't it? Thailand, and I'm like a world-class card carrying pleasure seeker. You know what I mean? I enjoy, you know, mm -hmm. anything that's good. I'll, I'll tear the ass out of it. <laughs> so when I got there, you know, it was uh, I had no kids. You know, I wasn't in a relationship. I had no ties. It was just me. I spent years, you know, in segregation units and prisons, and, and I thought this is it. You know, I'm going to live here. So when my friend went back, I decided to stay. You know, and adopt a new culture and learn a new language which was a bad idea because I was quite immature emotionally as well. So just... That's what I'm saying. Your friend dipped, you stayed. Oh, that's a... Uh-uh. A, a gateway to 
yeah. get kind of sucked in and, and back to where you were in Liverpool. Yeah. When you got the jail in, was it Bangkok, Hilton, Bangkok? Clong Prem. It was Clong Prem. Clong Prem, it was uh, Lad Yao Clong Prem. Um, I went to two prisons in Thailand. I went to the, the initial one was Chiang Mai. And then from Chiang Mai, after spending a year there, they took me down to Bangkok in uh -huh. Klong Prem Prison. And that was three years? Three years. Because in there, the first night you were there, you were sleeping next to a dead body, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I got taken from the, the courts and marched into this shell block that had, I think it was 79 prisoners. And there was nowhere to sleep. You know, there was a little piece, little space in the corner. It was next to a lady boy and a guy who died the night before. Um, and I remember the, the, the Thai lady boy's name was Tiffany, and she had this little top on that said "No money, no honey." <laughs> big bold letters, and I thought, "I'm grateful I've got no money because I'm more interested in the honey." And I remember him saying to me, "I like your blue eye." <laughs> I was thinking, "I hope you don't like the brown one." <laughs> and that was I kind of got through. Then first few days with a bit of a, um, you know, maybe, you know, uh, I, I don't know, just like that resilience, that that mm. that there's something within. I'm not gonna kind of like end up dead in one of these places. You know what I mean? Because did you count as well? Twenty five dead bodies get carried out the first yeah, week. The first week there was twenty five bodies taken off. Oh, the first week, twenty five back. The, out the prison in white sheets. You know, we were stepping over them, getting our medication in the hospital. It was quite. It's quite daunting, that. Yeah, uh, quite, quite uh, surreal as well. And, and it became normal. And you know when you were talking about like being conditioned, I got conditioned to accept that as normality in the end. You know, I seen some guy stab himself in the neck, stab himself in the chest. He had HIV, blood was pouring out of every orifice. Um, and everyone was like shocked. I would have ran. And looking and, and my first thought was I can get some hot water while everyone's looking and distracted by him. Mm -hmm. it, it just became normal. This is like year after year of witnessing uh, these kind of horrific ways yeah. of living. Yeah, it's, um, because over there there's a lot of drugs in these prisons, there's a lot of knives, is there any guns in these prisons? No, there's no way. Just um, knives? Yeah, there was, there was a lot of knives, uh, ice picks, machetes, I mean these are, uh, these are, <laughs> they're not like... homemade shifts that you get in prisons in the UK. These were like 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 real actual full blown machetes and hatchets and cogs off bikes, you know like the the, the cogs that they use. Uh -huh. Because they use them to chop up the ice and, and these are the uh, the instruments that they, they're being given. Because obviously that played a big part in on your book, being in that prison, prayer before dawn. Great book, great film as well. When you started when did you start writing for that? I started writing it when I was in, in Thailand, just documenting little bits of what I'd seen and how I felt as well. That was important, you know, being really descriptive and, uh, and admitting that I did feel scared and, you know, writing that down. And it kind of helped me. And then when I got to One's Word Prison, I showed this Being in a foreign jail in a country that you were not native to got to be one of the top serious things. Cause even if you like new to jail, but you in your own country, like you can still understand, you can speak the language, you can understand some of the nuances that are going on, you know, kind of what not to do, but like going to Ireland first time, the only thing that Billy had for him is he had been to jail before. So he know, you know, jail is jail at the end of the day, but like another country is still wild. Education teacher. An A4 piece of paper that I'd written. She took it away, came back, and went, Oh my God, that's amazing. You need to write more. At first, the thought she was stroking me ego, just trying to impress me. But she encouraged me to continue writing, so I did while I was there because I couldn't really talk to people about what I'd experienced because they couldn't identify it. They were like, You know, we haven't actually been through those uh -huh. experiences, so we don't really understand. So that helped. It was more therapeutic initially. It wasn't, I didn't expect to write a book. That was the truth. And, um, it was more kind of to help myself because when I came back, I was um, I had a culture shock. I was speaking fluent Thai by this time. I was quite passive um, due to uh, conditioned in, in prison in Bangkok. 
and I felt really, I felt alien in a sense when I came back to the UK. Yeah, but it must have fucked with your head over there, especially with the shit you've seen. How was the, there was a lot of ladyboys? Yeah. How were they? They were vicious and violent, some of them. Um, but it kind of added to the intimacy of the prison. Yeah. And they used to always play bingo and, you know, bring a different kind of... Uh -huh. Experience as well to the, the yeah, whole, they, they were selling they're... themselves. They were, it was like see outside in silence. See, lazy boys are, are seen as like scum most of the time, but when they were in prison, they were like superstars. Um, they were never my cup of tea in a sense of like I want a relationship with one of them. Uh -huh. Although in the film, it portrays like Joe as uh, meeting up with this young lady we call fame and, and developing a relationship and it became intimate and then it became sexual. Uh, that never happened. That's fiction, by the way. So he said. <laughs> <laughs> and you can Google that. Because <laughs> um, obviously if you're in prison, the, 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 most, the thing that's on your mind is the most is, is pussy. Is, and if there's people, listen, because I've, I've took girls home from a Saturday night drunk and I've been like, oh, <laughs> what the fuck have I done? So if you're yeah. over there, because some of the lady boys are stunning. Some of them are stunning. With the, a lot in the prison, mental health and, yeah. like, most addicts, of, yeah. stuff most, like that. Most, I think most of the lady boys that were in there were all drug addicts. Yeah. They were in for drug dealing or mm. killing boyfriends that, 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 that they felt a bit of injustice around. The beautiful ones that were, they were all taken. Anyway, so it was, uh, and the ones that had the full operation were segregated right. from the rest of the prison population. So they, well, that's because there was a lot of rapes in these in those prisons, isn't there? Yeah. There's a lot of uh, rapes, and it didn't matter whether you were male or female. To be honest, it's just any old goals with them. You know what I mean? Was there a lot of gang rapes and stuff over there? There was, yeah. There was, yeah. There's a lot of a uh, like. I don't know how you say genital mutilation. You know what they do with the, the, the penises? They cut it in half and, and put little bits of uh, glass and stitch it up and squeeze it with Vaseline so it's all kind of extended and it looks massive. And, and uh, you know, then it, they cut the, uh, the foreskin into four, it looks like flowers. And you know what I mean when they stitch it all up? It's quite weird what they do to the penises. Like, yeah, that's crazy. Oh, what in the godly? What is going on in Thailand? They're making origami meat? Origami meat? Yeah, that's nuts. Yeah. Did you ever, when you started getting into the, the fighting side of it in the prison, because you were, you were back on the drugs in prison, were you not? Yes, I was, yeah. You'd have to, you needed drugs just to kind of get through the day. You Could you get it all right in the prison? Well, it was mostly like medication, some Azipan, Valium, uh, painkillers. Yeah. The odd. <laughs> Is he still running? <laughs> <laughs> red rum over there. <laughs> the, the fighting side of things, because you were addicted to drugs, but you were, you were fighting a lot in that prison, were you not? Ah, I was causing a lot of chaos. Um, you know, I couldn't understand what they were saying to me. The language barrier was re really difficult. And, you know, I thought they were, like, like abusing me and, and insulting me. And they probably were at the time. And, it, you know, you could tell in the, in, in the way they were speaking, it was quite venomous. Um, I just react, you know, with the look. You, you know, I couldn't see what they were thinking, but I could see how they were behaving towards me. Um, so that caused a lot of problems, really. With myself, I ended up fighting a lot. Um, and it was only down to this one prison officer that said... Told you The language barrier going to cause a lot of issues. You know, you need to kind of change your ways or you're going to end up dead. Because... Uh, with the boxing side of things, you were in a bad, you were in a bad car crash or a motorbike, a motorcycle accident. Yeah, I had the motorcycle accidents in Laos. Uh, that was um, I went in, I went from Thailand to Laos to get a visa. It was a visa run, and I was on the wrong side of the road, and it was late. I'd been using drugs at the same time, so I wasn't I wasn't copus mentis. And two taxis, like tuk tuks, come race. They were chasing each other, and they come crashing right into me. You know, smashed the bike that I was on in half. The bike, the chassis went up, smashed into my ribs. I had the handlebar punching my lung, Ooh. and one of the brake levers going into my stomach, oh, and I got pushed, man. like 
I got rushed to a, 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 a like a third world hospital in a wheelbarrow with all kind of blood pouring out of me. It was quite horrible, really. Did you try and escape from the hospital? Did I, re I read that that you trying to escape? No, this one initially. This was uh, this was when I got arrested because I had to go for surgery when I was in Bangkok. So the accident had happened before I was arrested. Three months later, I'd, I'd been incarcerated. I'm in prison. I've still got these injuries. They need looking at. They've took me to hospital. Um, I'm on the seventh floor in this hospital in Chiang Mai, and the prison guards are just nowhere to be seen. They just turn up every 50 and hours, pop his head in, and that was it. And I, I realised the pattern that was going on here. And he had a little bit of money off one of the missionaries that come up, so I could buy a little bit of fruit, a little bit of food that came round, and, and I made this. I was dying for a cigarette, I was smoking at the time. I was just desperate for a ciggy. And I went down the back stairs to the exit, the door was open, and I couldn't believe it. I was outside and there was people on the grass having like picnics and I could see a 7-Eleven in the, in the background with a chemist next to it. And it seemed, it didn't seem that far away. I had shackles on my ankles at the time and I thought I'm going to go over there just to buy cigarettes. I did, I made it, I made it over there. And instead of going to the shop to buy cigarettes, I went straight into the chemist and bought loads of Tramadol painkillers first. Put them away and then went to the shop and got cigarettes. Came back and no one had seen or heard nothing. That was the first time I'd walked out the hospital. And I went back upstairs to bed. And a couple of nights, every night I used to go down the steps and have a cigarette. And no one would be no one would be in sight, no one would be there at all. So I decided to to to, to make a break for it one evening. It was two o'clock in the morning. Went downstairs, out to the exit, climbs over the, the railing fence at the hospital and was walking around the city early hours in the morning. And I thought, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? I can't steal a bike, you know. I can't I steal a car, I've got these shackles on my ankles. You know, if I get caught, I'm going to get another 25 years on top because it's a big thing to escape. I could possibly get shot. And I made that decision to go back a couple of hours later. And when I went back, no one else, again, no one had seen me or, or noticed that I'd gone. And I found myself back in my bed, just... I felt quite grateful, to be honest, that I'd made that decision back then. The best decision you ever made, because 25 years in a, in a Bangkok prison would have been crazy. Yeah, because three years is bad enough, never mind getting yeah, another 25 years. And I didn't think the embassy were going to kind of support me or hide me or harbour me or take me to back to the UK and go, right, we've shaved him from... Well, see, when you're in there, how does the embassy treat you? Do you? Are you in contact with anybody? Can they send... Are you trying to get home? Are you trying to get a transfer? Have you got to finish your sentence over there? Well, the embassy used to come up, like, once a month and just provide you with stamps and writing equipment, really. Not much. They couldn't really do much. and They didn't do much. Prisoners abroad were good. They got us uh, protein tablets and they used to send us 2,000 baht once a month in, which, you know, helped a lot. But I used that money to, to buy drugs, the protein tablets to swap for drugs. Um, I couldn't face reality. I couldn't face the day. I just wanted to sleep yeah. it away. Um, it was, it was yeah, quite austere yeah. and barbaric. So anything, any minds or moves also. Yeah, being locked up there, you... Like, I would say, like, in a... In like, in a... Like, in the UK... In America, like there's there's a little bit you can do some more stuff. You know what I'm saying? Literally out there, like the prisoners run the prison. It's it's bogus. It's seventy people in a little square, eight by eight. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, I... drug free is the way to be, but I damn near don't blame them. And chemical at that time, you know, was 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 purchased. Over, yeah, it's it's um, to, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's a tough fucking. It's a tough one over there. Yeah. Did you have a lot of friends with within the vicinity who were British themselves? I didn't get on with the foreigners for some reason. Did you not? I mean, no, I kind of uh, fell out with with them all the time. Very argumentative. They were very different from me. Australians, um, Iranians, Nigerians. Lots of Africans, um, and I didn't, I didn't get on well at all with them. I mean, see, when you were in the fight camp, you were because you were in the, the Muay Thai. Yeah, 
did that help you in the prison to get away from the bad stuff? Did you have better treatment? I did. What happened? What happened with the boxing was uh, I used to feel really envious to see them train. You know, when I was desperate, I was fucked on the drugs. You know, and, and then the drugs stopped coming because I couldn't pay for them. Right. You know, so I was hungry, and uh, and uh, and I think I was hungry in more ways than one. You know, I was hungry to kind of live as well. And I went along and I tried to join a boxing team and they refused to let me in and, and I kept coming back. And you know, eventually they said, yeah, look, give me a chance here. And then I found like unity and collectively as a group I was getting supported. You know, I was getting fed better. Um, I learned to speak Thai. I started to smile a bit more. You know, I started to enjoy life sense of community right now in prison point. a lot better than I did when I was using drugs. Um, some purpose in your life? Yeah, some, fo yeah, some focus, some purpose. And it was an escape from the conditions for just a, just yeah. a few hours, you know, just that training. Because uh, you know, I'd train for like three, four hours a day, constantly. I'd be on the bags, I'd be on the pads, I'd be in the ring, I'd be running around the, the compound, lifting weights. And when I say weights, it was like, two tins of paint with concrete in it and a brush pole <laughs> you know what I mean there was no there was no real weights it, was like, it wasn't like this gym we're in with he's getting it out of the mud out there red rum in the background <laughs> you know what I mean how was the food the food was oh my god it was like um, sticky rice and uh, like a soup with chicken heads in it another thing oh, that was horrible I put a spoon in one day and um, pulled out half a chicken fish with an eyeball in it I'm like, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? I went to throw it away. One of the ties grabbed it off my spoon and just started sucking its head. You know, and it was just, it was just, it was, it, it stunk as well. It was horrible to, to kind of, um, it wasn't even edible. You couldn't even describe it. Did you ever get food poisoning or? I got a lot the of shit. Yeah, a lot of the, the shits a lot. And I was poorly a number of times. I was in and out of the prison hospital. I don't think that was just due to the food, though, because in the end, uh, you know, the, the missionaries had come up and they'd buy us bits of bread Real and food. a few cartons of milk and, you know, that would help. Mm -hmm. Some fruit as well. Because, like, obviously, you've, you've had a lot of lows in your life, but you've not let it defeat you. No. Because you've, you are working with one of the biggest actors ever in the world, um, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. You were a stunt double in Rambo. How did that come about? Again... You know, that was just quite random. I was in a gym in Chiang Mai, and I seen this guy who... <laughs> he was a stunt double in Rambo? Which one, first and foremost? And can somebody give me the timestamp where he's the stunt doubling? Looked familiar, and I asked him, was he a boxer? He said no, he was an actor. And he, his name was Matt Marsden, and he worked on the set of uh, Coronation Street in the UK. So this is... I wasn't a big Cory fan, but he, he was quite familiar in some areas. I must have seen him somewhere. And I asked him what he was doing, and he said he was um, he was he was filming a movie called Rambo Four in in, Rambo in, Four. in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And I was dead excited for him, and you know all oh. the best. And two weeks later, a casting crew came into the gym where I was training, took our names, our numbers, a few photographs, and said to be in touch if we if they need us. Two weeks after that, I got a call and. and I thought it was one of my mates winding me up. They said, will you be Sylvester Stallone stone standing on Rambo? I went, oh, fuck off. You're having a laugh, aren't you? You don't even look like him. <laughs> he said, no, you've got the shape, you've got the size, you know. It's Hollywood can do the rest. Stone standing's got the shits with the green curries and, mm -hmm. you know, we Check need someone. Else. Yeah, so you're quite lucky and I was quite fortunate to get the opportunity and the money was shit, but I didn't mind going because, you know, he was my hero. I grew up watching Rocky, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I was at that era of growing up of like the Rocky movies and the Rambo movies and um, he was my hero so I was just grateful to be on set and um, you know I met him um, I spent a lot of time with him on Europe 1 he couldn't understand the word that was coming out of my mouth um, he said he needed subtitles to understand me <laughs> hey man what the fucking kind of language is this fucking talking about buddy? <laughs> so uh, yeah that was um, that was a great experience yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed that you know what I mean I loved it his Rocky impersonation is crazy and it was quite glamorous, it was an Hollywood movie set and 
I was quite fortunate, really. You know what I mean? To, to have these these A-listers. Yeah, yeah. How was it as a person, Big Sly? He was quite intimidating. Was he initially? Do you think that's because you've watched, you've grown up, grown up watching him? Yeah, it, it was. He, he had that aura of like you know he, there was a presence when he was there. You knew he was there. You know, people people felt a little bit passive around him, and and, and they were, and me being me, I just went right up to him and chat with him, and you know, and I said you're my hero, and he said no man, I'm a fraud. You know what I mean? <laughs> was, I'm just a fraud. Cause he's got some story himself. Yeah, he's brilliant. I mean, yeah. You no, know, I respect. I respect his his journey too, and. He was, he's a great director and he seemed as if he was always in character. What you see on set and in the movies is what you see in life. Mm -hmm. This is the way he was. Because he me. was near enough homeless and I think, because he wrote the script for Rocky yeah. and they wanted to buy it for a hundred grand yeah. and they knocked it back because he wanted to play the part. And I think he had to sell his dog and stuff. Yeah, I read that story. Yeah, yeah that was quite. So, yeah, he sold his dog, and it, once he he got he made Rocky, and he he played the part. He went back to buy his dog. Yeah, I think he, was, I think he sold the film for a hundred dollars. I, I might butcher the story here, but I think he sold it for a like hundred dollars, and they wanted to buy it back for like ten grand. I think he got the dog back. I never. So yeah. is that great? He created his own opportunities. And he's he created, he's, yeah, and that's what it's all about in life. Supply and demand. He wanted it back. I would have sold it for ten bands too. Is, is creating your own opportunities and yeah. you you don't make you, you can make your situations worse or you can make them better including yourself you've been in a prison where you've probably one of the lowest points of your life and you've created it into a book and a yeah. film where you've got you've won awards and you've did you've did massive things so when the book when you wrote first wrote the book did you see it going as big as you thought no do you know to be to be to be honest i was um when I was in that prison in Thailand, I've got to say how it is, I wanted to end my life. I remember asking this Thai guy to sell me his shoelaces, and he said, I can't, because he knew what I wanted to do. And I said, why can't you do that for me? He said, because collectively, as a group, as a shell, we'll get punished. And it's, you know, it's one of the rules that you can't kill yourself. And I thought, how bizarre is that? Because every morning there'd be 10 rules, and one of those rules was you can't commit suicide. And I thought, how fucked up is this jail? You know what I mean? You can't have sex, you can't, you can't sell drugs, you can't have weapons, you can't kill yourself. All these rules got listed off. Every single morning, I used to have to get up and stand to attention to the, the Thai National Anthem. It was like a prisoner of war camp. How fucked up is that? I was forced to stand there, 8 a.m. every morning. And I can remember the... And we'd all have to stand there to attention while the flag went up. <laughs> I was like, fuck this, man. I'm not a fucking like prisoner of war. Yeah. yeah, it was weird. And um, so, yeah, I was at really all point lows where I wanted to end my life. And, you know, people just kept intervening. It was weird. They just kept intervening. You, you know, just be strong. You've only got a small set. No, you had a higher calling. You had a higher calling. People didn't interfere. God interfered. He knew your message needed to be heard. And, and and he knew your message would save somebody else's life. And it probably has done that a hundredfold times. So I don't know if you believe in him, but you hear it for him. He believed in you. Since it's not that long, but a day in there was like a lifetime, you know, anywhere else. And when I started writing, it wasn't to write a book, it was to get through the feelings that I'd, I'd experienced. It was horrible, man. It was like, I was, I was writing about uh, the pain and, and the fear and the loss and, and the loneliness and, and the separation from society. Um, and I was reading it back to myself and I was writing about a lot about my dad as well, growing up. You know, the contributing factors that led to, to my drug use. And when I'd read it, I remember sitting in a cell in one's way of prison and reading it and, and sobbing. Because, you know, I couldn't escape the words that were on the paper. I was, I was writing about my dad and, you know, the beatings I'd received and, and the rejection and the abandonment and, and the lack of love. Um, and it's his fault. And, you know, and I know we've got choices, but sometimes the choices that we have in life are taken away from us, especially at an early age. I grew up and, um, you know, I was free and I was carefree and, 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 and I wanted to... I wanted to join the army. I had dreams of joining the British army and, and becoming a great boxer and... You know, and he ended up becoming a drug addict and spending most of my life in prison. You know, and I, I, I never... Very, that's two very opposite things.
But I bet you if he asked him, would you change anything, he'd probably say no. Because of who it made him today. Imagine in my wildest dreams, that, that's what had happened. So when I started writing this, it was... Um, never believed it would even become a book. So when it did become a book, and it was published first in Thailand, I was, I was proud of what I'd achieved. I couldn't believe it. Um, it wasn't getting sold in the UK at that time. It was quite small. Not, not many people knew about it. And then I found a publisher in uh, the UK, and it became a bestseller within six months. And then I took this book to a production company in Liverpool, just to open for a documentary. Like Something like too. a little bit of exposure. Okay, I've wrote a story, I'd like the people to read it, um, get a little bit of exposure about it, maybe a documentary. And they took it off me. At first, they, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't accept it. They told me to go away, I kept coming back. I said, look, you need to read this. Um, and they were hiding all the time from me. In the end, they took it. I think he felt, you know, he felt, look, we'll just do him a favour here because he's doing our head and so he took it. So we'll be in touch. Three months later, he got in touch and had me sitting around his table with them. Saying, we love the book. In the, the 10 years that we've been here as a company, we've all put our hands up and said we want this to become a movie. And I was like, a fucking movie. After all of that, after all that denying you, they came back and wanted to make it a movie. Perseverance. Hey, pay attention. Read between the lines, people. If you're not taking a lesson from what he's saying directly, take a take a lesson from the per to the perseverance. Keep going, even if it seems like it'll never happen. <laughs> Keep pushing. Movie. Are you serious? And then he started talking about A list actors and you know, I think Charlie Unham was on board. He was in Sons of Anarchy. He was on board for a year. And everyone was excited. And to be honest, I'm glad he never took the role because it wasn't meant for him. You know, the young kid that uh, got the role, Joe Cole, was absolutely powerful in the performance. I spent a lot of time with him. Oh, this, who is, you know him, who is, what, what else, where do I know him from? What movie is this? What's the name of the movie? Hey. Uh, and he was there we go peaky blinders no from peaky blinders keen and he was eager and he wanted this you know what i mean where all the other names were just for the finances just accepting it just for work for them yeah it was like oh we'll get in because and, and he didn't want your call right that's the suit um and i said why not me the director wanted your call and he went why not he said because he's not a big enough name for the finances you know, we've got to raise capital on, on people's names. And I said, well, I don't care about raising capital on a name. I just want this story to be told as authentic as possible with someone who's willing to, to, to throw it. Every, his heart. Yeah. And, he it, put his heart and his soul into that. And, and we, you know, we, we, we got him. We persevered. But to be honest, I gotta watch the production scene never had a name anyway. You know, so it was, it was good that we got him. So it's helping put everybody in the map. Yeah. Do you think... The book saved your life then, writing it. I think it's done a bit of both, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Kind of nearly kill me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it allowed me to. Um, it allowed me to to, to to talk about my past and, and my history briefly, and the experiences that I'd been through. Okay. But then came like the ego. You know, a lot of people started to show me attention. I couldn't cope with that. That was quite difficult. You know, I was getting uh, interviewed a lot. I was on the red carpet in Cannes. You know, I was in a tuxedo. I've never even wore a suit unless it was going to court. <laughs> I'm in a tuxedo in Cannes. Um, I've got the paparazzi interviewing me um, and taking pictures. And I felt quite like... Um, it felt, felt quite weird. It felt like it was, it was someone else's life story being portrayed on the big screen. And it wasn't really me. And I didn't feel worthy. You know, I didn't feel, feel, feel like... What is the book called? I'm going to go watch the movie. I fitted in to society. I felt like a misfit. And I was confused why so, so many people were interested. For me, I was just like a junkie from a council well, estate look at the book that had yeah, been through a really tough time in life. Uh, come out the other side and motorbody and, and all of a sudden these people want to 
turn it into a, to, 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 to a movie. It was quite mad, really. Um, and I was, you know, I, was, I, was, I wasn't savvy in the industry. I, I, I admit that I'd kind of been a bit naive and I was misled and, you know. But you you've know. got to be proud of it. Yeah. Because yeah. It's, it's, it's your legacy that's going to be here from someone who has addiction problems, who's not had the best upbringing, to being in 22 prisons, to be in making a film and a book about you. Because we spoke earlier, there's talk of... You've got something else in the pipeline for the future for yourself, a part yeah, two? Yeah, I've wrote... Oh, really? I wrote... I went to prison again. I, I came to... I seem to, <laughs> I seem, I seem to write... I seem to write books when I go to prison, so I don't want to do a trilogy, you know what I mean? It's not going to be a part three. But yeah, this first one I wrote when I was away, the second one I wrote when I was away, and, and the reason I can, I can write like that is because I've got time, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Um, and I'm with myself. You know, outside there's a lot of distractions. Um, so when I wrote the second one, I call. You know, and what I, happened to his ear? I've titled it "Surrender from the Heart." See, people ask me why do you call a face when I pray before dawn, and I remember pray before dawn. Okay. Thinking of a title, I wrote a synopsis, and I was thinking of a title for this new book, and I was thinking, "Welcome to Hell," and you know, we we can we can kind of dark, dead dark. You know, you know what you're gonna expect, and I remember. When I was in, I see it, I talk about it in the book, I was hungry and these Muslim guys offered me a bit of food. So I sat down with them and I ate with them and I thought to myself, I'll come back the next day. So I went back the next day and he said, really Billy, only the Muslim brothers eat here. These were all Malaysians and, and, and Southern Thai. So I said, that's okay. So I put a sarong on, changed my name to Yusuf Muhammad. <laughs> I sat with them for a year. You know, I learned to speak Arabic, you know, I read the Quran, I understood. You know, we asked them questions as well because I wanted to know. Yeah. You know, what's what's all this uh, extremism going on about what's, what's you know, I didn't know. I'd only heard what I'd... You seen the news or the yeah, radio? Yeah, seen the news, right. the radio, what I'd read in the papers, what wear the mouth. But they were quite lovely. They were quite, like, you know, so they moved me into the shell. So I prayed five times a day with them. And every morning before dawn, I'd, you know, I'd wake up and, and people would be praying. First, it'd be the Muslims with the um, chanting the, the sutras, you know, you know, every morning that I'd get, that I'd read right through the prison system, and then it'd be, you know, the imam would be calling the prayer to Fajr, and that was the prayer before dawn. So, I'm not gonna lie, Billy was in prison finding a way. <laughs> the boxing community in one, then the Muslim community in another. I thought to myself, you've got Christians, Muslims, uh, Buddhists all praying at the same time, right, and then you open them gates to go out in the compound. It's like the, it's like it's like hell on earth, you know. And everyone's fighting just to get through the day. So it was quite ironic, really. So I called it and I, I named it. I prayed before dawn, but the second one, you know, surrender from the heart. Is, it's more of a backstory. The contributing factors that led up to. Yeah. Why is there not? Why is it? You not got a picture at the front? I did have one in the front. I don't know, I don't know, they should do, they put a picture of me. I think there's one in, there's not even one on the back, is there? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm not pretty enough. <laughs> Never mind. Because in there, in, while you were in prison as well, you got a tattoo. Yeah. But the tattoo, they do, it took over a week, and the tattoo there, they used guitar strings. Rusty guitar strings with ink, yeah. where that painful. was smuggled in. Yeah, very painful, very painful. And it cost me a, a sleeve of cigarettes. And I was under the influence of drugs when he asked for it to be done. Uh, I thought it was a good idea at the time. What and I was into my Muay Thai boxing and I, 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 I boxed for England as a schoolboy. I was involved with the NABCs, the ABAs, the ABCs. And that was part of my life all the time, fighting. I'd always fought, you know what I mean? And, 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 and you know, fought at home, I'd fought on the streets, I'd fought on the prison landings. And the biggest war I ever fought was with our felt and admitting that, you know, I had I needed courage to ask for help, so they were kind of like it was all about fighting. So yeah, I got a Muay Thai boxer put on my back. Oh, okay. That's how soon. Guitar strings. I bet you guitar it strings. Good. It, it was quite. Raw. It probably looked insane. Like and he it. fucked it up as well. Oh, he messed <laughs> it up. He ran out of ink. <laughs> right, he ran out of ink in the gym. <laughs> he, the, the fella on the back in the tattoo has got a big pink hairdo. <laughs> A big bouffons, <laughs> a fuming. Because <laughs> when you were in, and because in that prison as well, it's 
you're mixed with paedophiles and you're not just mixed with like rapists and you're mixed with like rapists, paedophiles you're no it's no like sections or protection wings yeah or there's no there's, there was no numbers or protection it was like you were, you were you were bangs up I was bangs up with some unsavory characters and people knew what they were in for and no one was you know attacking them or, or, or verbally abusing them for the crimes that they committed and they were horrendous some of them you know raping on raping two year old babies and you know grooming Kids, you know what I mean? It was horrible. Yeah, that's yes, it's bad for that over there. Made me feel uncomfortable, to be honest. Yeah, but another big... F <laughs> you've had that many fucking fights in your life, Billy. But you had cancer. Yeah, cancer, cancer in the yeah. neck. Yeah. She, yeah, um, I'd like to talk about that briefly because I was... It. I'd came back from Thailand, I'd rebuilt my life. I'd got a job working, you know, in the community, helping addicts in recovery. I was full-time employed, had a house by this time, a car, you know, a loving relationship. Five years down the line, uh, my dad had passed away, cancer. Sorry to hear that. Um, I was at his bedside, and I told him I loved him with the elder's hand, and it was, you know, you know, it was heartbreaking because that's, he told me he loved me at the same time when he died, you know what I mean? And that's all he ever wanted from me, dad. And I got this diagnosis pretty quick, Quick, pretty, like, pretty soon after he passed away, and I was on set playing the role of my father. That's you know that's how I've kind of acknowledged his his life, playing the role of my dad. And um, it was hard because I'd been diagnosed with cancer on set, playing the role of my dad, watching this this young lad, this young actor come through. And the director said to me, "If you're your father, what would you say to your son?" You know, and all I wanted my dad to say is I love you. Um, and when this young kid comes towards me and I was looking at him, our eyes locked, and he knew what was going on because he'd done a character study. And it was 5 a.m. in the morning, it was in the Philippines where we were filming, and I'm just, it was like, I, could, I, I was just that emotional. You know, I was, that, I was welling up that much that I couldn't even muster the words I love you to, to, to this young Billy, uh, this young me, really, trying to connect with him. Uh, and then it ended, the movie finished, I went home, the cancer progressed, uh, I was on chemotherapy by this stage, I had three operations, I was introduced back to opiates, production team have moved on, the director's doing his editing, the actor's gone on to other job opportunities, you know, I'm left at home now, you know, I'm, I, I'm sick, <coughs> I'm in. Um, <coughs> you know, my mental health starts to deteriorate, I'm taking more and more drugs, to uh, kind of avoid the feelings that I'm feeling, you know what I mean? I don't really, you know, the, the, the impending zooms in my mind and, you know, waking up thinking I'm going to die because that's all I ever, I, I thought the cancer cancer was, you know what I mean? You're going to die, simple as. Your dad had passed away, you're going to go. You know, I had that fuck it's kicked in. And any money that I'd made off the movie, which was only little amounts I'd, I'd spent, uh, trying to bury myself in in in, in a narcotic kind of kind of stupor. But uh, thankfully, you've you're you're all clear. Yeah, and, thank, and and also you're eighteen months clean, clean and sober again. Yeah, well, shake your hand for that, brother. Thank you. Oh, yeah, congrats. eighteen months clean today. Um, you know, it was um, you know trying to get a morning clean was difficult, but mm -hmm. you know after all that, uh, you know. Yeah, and this was five years ago, so he's... You know, I went, I went back to prison, didn't I? I said that before. Um, and I went back to prison clean. I was five months in recovery. You know, and that was a new experience. Spending a year in a prison in Liverpool. Being an observer. Uh, clean, clear-minded. Watching the, um, the drug use paranoia on the landings. People getting slashed, people stabbing each other people getting sexually abused with this new drug spice, you know, and I, I, I'm witnessing in, it. In and I started, this is where the second story comes in. I started to write about what my journey from being released from Wandsworth was like up until the present day. You know, the cancer, the contributing factors that led to me relapse, um, the crime that I committed, it was a resentment with my neighbour. I went through his house and got arrested, charged, and because of my history, I got a sentence. You know, it's embarrassing and I feel really ashamed of the actions. 
because you're in the public eye now. Yeah. So anything you do is going to be yeah. blown out of proportion as well. I'm not. Um, and so you're off, big man. It's nice to see you. Um, because anything you do from being on the red carpet in Cannes, from doing movies with uh, Sylvester Stallone, and anything you do now, it's going to be a hundred mm -hmm. times worse than what it actually is. Yeah. But you've got to kind of take that on the shoulder. As, you've got to kind of take that on the chin as well. But f for moving on for the future for you, what's the plans? And where do you see yourself now that you're clean, now that you're sober, now that you're cancer free? Do you d d does that scare you as well that? the cancer could come back or does it scare you that the listen we could all relapse I don't know what the fuck's around the corner I don't know what's happening tonight me and you could be lying in a, a crack down yeah. <laughs> the night sharing <laughs> sharing a paper <laughs> bag you went over a, a song or something flight yeah. over to Thailand <laughs> so but the plans for the future what's the what do you see there's a future bright for you surely it is because everything you've came through you're, a, you're clearly a strong character you just you beat cancer you're, you're writing a second book so where do you see yourself in the future this time? Do you see it positive, happy? See, my life today, right, is I live with my mum in a bungalow, sleeping on a sofa, wearing a tag, in a house with seven little dogs, all little bichons, right? Um, I, I was released from prison Christmas Eve. I had high expectations of, of doing things. Um, I felt ashamed of going to prison and, and a public flog and I'd probably received and, and to be fair it, it wasn't that bad people kind of understood Channel 4 News fucking hell they're horrible um, they're a different agenda which upset me um, but I had interviews with Professor Green and, and the Independence and, and, and Liverpool Echo and they were quite fine you know what I mean they were quite understanding of um, of my demise and my journey but yeah you know since I've been out I've kind of put me focus in, 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 in teaching young kids, you know, how to box. Um, I'm a chair, I'm a chairman for a knife gang, well, a knife crime campaign in Liverpool. It's called Platform for Change, uh, Danny's yeah, Place, cool. and it's, you know, it's, it's me and people in the community coming together to kind of guide young kids into a new way of living. And it's it, that's important, I don't think... You know, I wish I had someone when I was younger to, 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 to give me that guidance and that direction. It was quite different. You know, I don't think we had that kind of funding back then, but it's nice to, um, to have the opportunity to help someone else. You know, yeah. that old I'm not going to lie. He has a crazy origin story, like from start to finish. Everything he's went through as a child, all the addiction problems, all the jail, jail in different countries, cancer, movies. And, and think about it from from this from this podcast to now, what's going on is just another chapter in his whole life. Like, another chapter of elevation. It's, it's, bro, it's, he's really walking his destiny down. That's tough. He is not playing. He's walking with real purpose nowadays. Ulcerism. Being ulceristic. Like. Being there for... It's, I'm not asked about money. I'll tell you that, James. Right? I never have been... I've not got a fucking pot of pissing. I couldn't care less. You good? Now. I enjoy life. I enjoy living. Um, if I can put a smile on your face, <laughs> right, that rewards me. Yeah. Um, if you can pick up the phone and want to speak to me and go, Bill, you know what? I've got a problem here. Can you can you listen to what I've got to say and and maybe you know share a bit of your experience? Then that's enough. Um, I'm not muddy oriented. Never have been. I'd be nice, you know, make your misery a bit more. Luxurious, yeah, but um, it's never it's never been a big 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 thing of mine. Got a little car, um, and, I, and I'm building that relationship up with my mum. You know, I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll soon progress to moving off the couch uh, no. to the place, <laughs> you know. But I'm quite happy being here at the minute. Um, but again, it's all you, you know what needs to be done now. Yeah, you've wrote a successful book, bestseller. Yeah, you've created a film from it. So who says you can't do it again? This time you may on the ball because in this industry a lot of people are out to fuck you yeah. and you've clearly we had a chat earlier where you're only getting a very small percentage, a very, very small percentage yeah. of the things that you're doing and it's your life. It's other people that, that is rewarding and benefiting from yeah. it. Yeah. I think people always ask me the same question. There's two questions that I've always been asked lately. Was that scene in the film with the ladyboy through? No, it wasn't. Uh, and how much are you getting? And... I, you'd get more on benefits than you would Seriously. today from making a movie. 
that's just truth. You know what I mean? Um, it's crazy, isn't it? It is. It's people think you you write a story, and and they make a movie about your life, and and you're loaded. But that's not the truth. You know what I mean? Same, I'm seeing you went to prison there. The the last thing. That was after the film, that was after everything, wasn't it? Yeah. Were you still in contact? Did a lot of people turn their back on you? How was it for you, that experience? Because I know you just said you did it clean, so obviously you're more aware. Yeah. Where you're aware of your actions even more. And we, we speak about it all the time on this show. That the, the, only, the only people who, who maintained contact was Joe Cole, the actor. You know, I'd contact him. Uh, we, were, we were speaking, you know, a lot on the phone whilst I was away and he was non-judgmental, he was very supportive, he, he was understanding, and that's because he spent a lot of time with me, and he knows me, and he knows with sound the clear of mind that most of the things that I did, I wouldn't do, uh, in, in, in clean, so, you know, he was he was there for me, and, and, and a few of the distributors, and they that's were there, good. they were supportive, and they helped me when I got out, you know, and the producers, they moved on, especially the ones in Liverpool, you know, I'm quite upset that the way they turn it back on me, you know, I committed a crime, you know, it's not a crime but a sense, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, proud of that fact, but I didn't get up one day and go, I'm going to do that, and that's just what I'm going to harm other people, you know what I mean, um, and it, it's, uh, you know, it saddens me today, you know what I mean, it really, really does, I feel, there's no about fuck them, yeah. we all make mistakes, we're all going to, we don't know what's around the corner, and yeah, we, we regret things that we do, but we're human, you're a man enough to accept it and you're man enough to move on from it. So yeah, for yeah. me, anybody that's turned their back on you, fuck them. Fuck them. Do you know what I mean? You've you've been a lot more lonely positions than waiting for someone to maybe get your letter up or try and help you out. But again, you've come through them all, you've come through that much in your life to mm -hmm. to get to where you are to where you are now. Now you're fighting fit again. Yeah. You're doing big things, mate, so and now you're doing the knife crime things. I would And now you're doing even bigger things. You're really going crazy then it can be disheartening see when you wait, after the book came out and the film came out is that when you started dabbling again and the drugs did it get did it the attention kind of push over the edge and no but it was the moments I got diagnosed with uh, cancer and then a, the reintroduction back to opiates uh, now yeah, as you yeah. said at the beginning of the interview I'm the kind of person mm -hmm. that you know you know I'm allergic to drugs if I don't I don't break out in lumps and bumps, I break out in pain, misery and loss. And he ends up in handcuffs. This is what happens. So when I got reintroduced back to uh, opiates, you know, the doctor would give me painkillers and tell me to take two every four hours. And then I'd start abusing them. I'd take four every four hours, then it'd be six. And then I'd like the feelings and then I'd be like, me, me mind would be clouded with all this kind of, these drugs. And I didn't want to feel no more. And you know, before long I'm in the grip of addiction and I'm snowballing massively into it. And my drugs become more important than my life, than my family, than my friends. I separate myself. Um, so it was it was on that it was just I was in cans under the influence. And you wouldn't know, you wouldn't tell because I I heard it really well from everyone. And we are good on our addicts are the yeah, best that we are. can hide and lie. It's manipulative, I'd blame, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd blame it on the illness, I'd blame it on the cancer, you, you know, you look like you've lost a bit of weight, oh yeah, well, you know why, and, you know, and to be honest, right, James, I was, I get, like, really, like, nervous when it comes to interviews, and, uh, and, I, and I remember getting interviewed, well, being interviewed by a few people and it becomes scripted and I've seen that to you before yeah, I don't yeah, really yeah. want to sound like someone who's reading off a, a, a yeah, script yeah talking the same know. stuff you know I enjoy um, I enjoy my life you know we've only got a few short decades here you know I want to do something good with it and I want to I want to I want to enjoy it you know what I mean I want to um, I, I want other people to enjoy this mm -hmm. um, if I can help you yeah if you're willing to meet me halfway then fine uh, if you want to help me then you know, and I'll meet you halfway. Then that's that's good. You know, I haven't got a, I haven't got a, I haven't got a publisher for this new book. You know, I've, I've been hurt and i misled and you know, loads of trust issues over the the last um, three, four years. Three or four years. You probably had trust issues all your life, but then yeah. when you start seeing people being sleeker and, yeah. and fucking your left, right, and centre again, then your trust issues are, issues are going to come back. Right. So for anybody watching, because we get a, a lot of people watching and listening. Because we want to get your second book published. Yeah. We want to even get it made into a second film. So if anybody watching or listening, get involved. How can people get in contact with you, Billy? Uh, they can 
contact me via Twitter or you know I've got an email. It's Billy Moore thirty five at Yahoo dot co dot UK. Facebook, <laughs> all the social media Everything. sites. Yes, Everything. definitely getting involved. I'm in quite, I'm quite, I'm quite, I've got Instagram, I'm quite open. You know what I mean? To get anybody, get involved in, I get your, again, that's a, your story going through the cancer, the other story of being back in prison, it's, it is a, you have got a story to tell and people are interested in, even though it can be against your misery, which is tough. Do you know what, it's mad, isn't it? Because I don't think I've got like a story to tell, I think I'm just another... Nah, you got a story. I'm gonna hear if I cringe right? Nah, you got a story. The, 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 the past hour that I just listened to, that's an insane story. The entire thing from start to finish. Childhood all the way up to current. Elliot. This is five years, five years ago? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll let you out. One hundred embarrassed. Yeah, I get embarrassed. Um, I even get embarrassed about... Selling people a great one, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course, but you've still got to value your worth because when we do good things, we spoke about it earlier, we feel as if we don't deserve it. Yeah, Why are we doing this? We, we don't be deserve to be standing on a red carpet. We don't deserve to be making a film with the good actors. And, and and that's just because we've been told we're not good enough for yeah. such a young age. We feel as if... But yeah. again, fuck everybody else. We've all got a past. We all make mistakes, but anybody can change. I don't give a fuck who you are. So for, for anybody... We get a lot of people who's got addiction problems and... I watch this show as well. For anybody in the struggle, what advice would you give them right now? Because you're eight, 18 months clean again. You're back on the path. You're, you're thinking straight. You're wanting to do good things. So what kind of advice would you give for someone who's in the struggle? I'd just say, look, if you're going to struggle, struggle with a smile and, uh, you know, take each day as it comes. And it's stay vigilant. Uh, don't take life too seriously, but take your recovery. Make sure your recovery is important. It's like... I, I go to meetings and, and, and I hear people talk about recovery and I hear people talk about clean time and, and half the time it's, it, it, it's self-talk, that negative talk. I feel shit today, oh, this, that and the other. And I think, do you know what? The more you sell yourself that, the more well, you're going to believe, gonna believe it, the more you're going to yeah, condition yourself when you start telling yourself it's okay. There's power in the tongue. There's power in the tongue, man. You got to watch what you say and watch what you speak on yourself and others because... You know, you're alive, you've got food in the cupboards, you've got a roof over your head. Some people mightn't have that, but you've got people in your life who'll support you and who are willing to help you. And and that's what it's about, it's about turning up. You know, I've got a head full of cartoons. My head is like, <laughs> it, 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 I get obsessed. I, 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 and then compulsed to do things. Um, at the minute, I'm, I'm on a mad kind of training regime where I want to drop a few pounds because I feel fat. And people say, you look great, but to me, I don't, I, 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 I fucking, I think, oh, you look overweight and, you know, yeah, and you need to be fit. And I forget that I'm 46, you know, and I can go rounds with MMA fighters and, you know, and I can do an hour non-stop on an E-mon and, and shake it so I can get in the ring and spar them. But in here, we're still 16 and 18. Yeah, yeah, I'm st still a kid, I'm still yeah, young, I'm still, still young man. But again, I said to you earlier, you have lost a lot of weight. Yeah. You're clearly on the path, you're clearly doing well again. And it's great to see you, mate, because you're a, a fucking diamond, you're a good guy, Billy. Thank you. I wish you all the best for the future. The girl from Exercise for Less, because we're in this gym, and we'll give her a shout out. Kaylee. Kaylee, she's hiding now. Yeah, she's hiding. Uh, for using her gym. Yeah, and thanks, yeah, thanks to Kaylee. Mate. How can we get, how can people get involved in your book, Prayer Before Dawn? You can get that on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's a few. I mean, you've only got to Google it, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it'll come up. You know, and you can Amazon. watch it on YouTube. Also, you can pay for it on YouTube, and we're also Sky on Demand. Yeah, and we're, yeah Google. and we're trying to get it on Netflix. There's also. Um, I want to watch it. Okay. Yeah, there's also on the DVD. There's an interview or a documentary with me, Professor Green. But you can only watch that if you buy the DVD. You see it on. It's uh -huh. not on YouTube. That it's mad. Um, this is quite interesting. Uh -huh. I mean. But for anybody get involved, anybody can help Billy out with his new book or documentaries or whatever, because he's got some stories. A great guy. Again, if you want anything to promote or anything, your anything is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Billy, James. Listen for coming on today and telling your story. I appreciate that, brother. All right, now I got the full gist of Billy Moore. I didn't know. Pause. I got the full story behind Billy Moore. I'm pretty sure there's more. I'm gonna go watch the movie. I ain't even gonna hold you. Um. But yeah, very interesting stuff. Man's life is crazy. So in my mind, he deserved everything he got and, and, and all the success he's getting, whatever else comes to him positive. So salute.